<clears throat> Hello, everybody. So today's um, day two of this week, and we this week covers some very important parts for main development. Uh, on Monday, we looked at records. Um, it's a very brief introduction. Uh, math classes where those would be covered are usually much, much higher math classes. And what we looked at the other day is pretty much what we'll need for debugging games. We can break it down and think about right triangles and stuff whenever bugs happen. It makes coding a lot easier. We can we could code it without the vectors. It just makes the code messier and longer. Um, so it's a little bit cleaner in the code, but the big thing with vectors is we need the vector, certain aspects of vectors to debug it. And what we need for that can be broken down and think about right triangles mostly, along with um, simple uh, scaling and adding vectors, the linear properties. This happened the other day. And we'll use those, such as for movement, right? We have uh, some vector components, uh, maybe two dimensional x, y component uh, that would be legs of a right triangle. And then the hypotenuse of that triangle is where we want to move the image. So that's the one for today is looking at graphics. We are short on time. We can't cover much. I'm trying to get quite a bit in, but that's something that's very much a doing thing. There's an assignment this week. One of the quizzes, you will do a couple uh, couple small animations. They uh, shouldn't, be, shouldn't be too bad. And while it is a grade for your own artwork, if you're not evaluated, you're not going to be evaluated harshly later for the completion grade and expect comments. So everybody is going to have different, different uh, skill levels when it comes to the art. In a lot of software development, we can we separate front end and back end. Not just that we can, we do regularly. There's front end developers and there's back end developers. And a project manager ties together what they do. It's not the case in game development. They're too intertwined. We can't we can't separate them. Even if your part on the team is always going to be writing code, you do need at least some intimate familiarity with graphics and how graphics work. And um, a few components about them, even if all you're ever going to do is write code on that team. But it is highly unlikely that any person on any game developer team would only be writing code. Uh, or one that's going to show up most often for the people in this pathway versus somebody that went for a design degree, where all you, the person with a design degree is probably planning on doing 90% making models. Whereas software developer, game developer, perspective is probably thinking 80-90% writing code and then 10% of the modeling and animating. Uh, so there's different focuses, but we can't get away from it. And one of them, at the very least, is placeholder images. So for the most part of this semester when we're, we're making our games and stuff, we're going to be working with placeholder images. And that's just a file, right? We have the image file, we load that up, we start moving it, make sure it moves correctly, is sized correctly and everything. And then later we'll come back and add and tell the art department what size the image needs to be. Like give us a really nice version, and then all we have to do at the end is swap out the files. Usually we'll tell the art department what it needs to be named, and we don't even have to change any code or anything. We just delete the one that's currently in the project folder and paste in the what paste in the one the art department sends us. It's got the right name, right size, and everything. It's going to automatically just the game is just, just going to load the different one. So at the very least, we'll need placeholder images. So that's kind of what we're going to look at today. Placeholder, 2D, 3D models, so a lot of still images. So there's an important thing about uh, important thing about the graphics. Uh, is it's a well-known trait. It's not new. Uh, let me write words on them. Uh, write some words up here. Great big bugs can easily hide behind tiny 
Disney animations. That's the back of what I did with the game development, uh, and a very important one. A little bit of distraction goes a long way, right? Uh, one of the best traditional examples is the stage magician, right? So it'll be like, look, there's nothing up my sleeve to show you the left arm. Everybody look at my left arm when you pay no attention to what my right hand was doing in the house. While I was showing you my left arm, right? A little bit of distraction goes a long way. Some game developers swear by writing your code with just rectangles. You don't even want circles because that, that rounded edge can be distraction. Debug things with rectangles moving back and forth and bumping into each other and nothing possible, nothing distractive whatsoever. Or the minimum shape, right? If you're going to have a capsule shape going through some things, we're going to talk about when we get to physics. So, so. And the reason that uh, we talk about normal the normal vector and why that. We might need one more thing with vectors for debugging, but we'll deal with that when we get to it. Or uh, talk about it around the long way when we get to physics. Uh, but if everything's going to have like a capsule shaped collider, we want our graphics to be the minimal, just capsules moving around so that there's no distraction. We can get all the bugs worked out for the right shapes. And then we start putting in the good graphics and the invisible boundaries around those graphics. So, uh, set that stuff up because giant bugs will hide behind little bitty animations like the traditional stage magician distraction. It's just enough that we won't notice it. Uh, it'll go completely unnoticed for multiple set buys, but then it can escalate into something larger very quickly. <laughs> uh, so I usually go a little bit further with placeholder images. I'm trying to get something that's in rough shape. So even if it's not perfect, there'll be something quickly drawn that's like a person shape, right? It, well, any more kind of general expectation for it, it varies by game by game, but a lot of people kind of expect hitboxes to be what you see. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like they don't expect to be able to shoot right here. And hit the arm. They expect the hitbox to just be the. You know what I mean? Like yes, yes. Any more of the models typically is the model is the hitbox. Typically. Um, it depends from game to game. We, we're gonna we'll talk about that uh, because I'm not saying the model is the hitbox. I'm saying like what you see of the model exactly is where the hitbox. Is. That that's something that, that's something coming up soon. Yeah. So it it's actually impossible to do that. We have to pick and choose, but we'll see that. Next week, actually. So that is kind of a thing. But like, this might be the start of the animation I developed the code with. Like, okay, this is the character, and it'll look like this. Maybe not even the color. So basically, it's just a little more than the stick man, but it's the right size. I usually do colors, too. The right colors. So some, some of y'all have started working on the discussion board, um, which I didn't uh, have an important note about that. Um, remember, uh, not to reference existing games. So in the discussion board where you're describing a game, make sure you um, don't refer to any existing games. Because references to existing games will resi result in a point deduction on those things. Actually, I'll probably, the comments will say, I don't know what that game is, and then take points off. Like that's, that doesn't make a description because I don't know what that game is. So you have to actually describe it. So, um, if you wanted to describe something like uh, trying to think of a, a good example, like Mario Kart, you couldn't say so, like Mario Kart. You have to talk about the rainbow rainbow track floating in space. You can just drive off the side of and kind of fall into fall into an abyss and the bright colors and the flashing lights and the foreground and background for distraction and break down the pieces because this is game development. So we need to focus on those development pieces. Um, which, if if it happens, uh, and like, unless you wait to the very last minute to do the things, I will send you a message if you're like, oh yeah, you can edit the discussion board so, and give tips on how to describe the game and stuff. But 
give detailed descriptions, not comparisons to our existing games. Uh, I did. That was an important mention, and I had a list of things to do, and it distracted me from where I was a moment ago. Talking about graphics, so we need the starter images. So we'll look at that. Maybe a little bit of animation. I'm usually do things that are the right size, roughly the shape they're going to be, um, and get the color palette going. And that way, when I show it to the art department and ask for final versions, it has the entire the color palette selected already. They'll refine it and expand it or refine uh, right, do the professional artists. But it gives a better the art department a better starting point of what you're thinking of. Animations are easy. We'll work those in uh we'll work those in later, but that's probably the first thing to show today. It's gonna be a very much a follow-along thing. Um great tools make a big difference. So before I start sharing my screen, this little tablet here. Everybody seen these before. Why is this popping up? I delete, sorry, there's a notification popping up on my screen. I deleted all the, I turned off notifications and stuff and it's still, it won't stop coming. Stuff from HP. Um, oh, I'll turn this camera on. Everybody seen these little pins before? Usually a little tablet. I think this particular one I want to say was 28 bucks. I bought it on the cheaper side. I bought a large one that was like basically the size of my whole laptop that was like 80, I think. Yeah, yeah. There's a huge range. I mean, they can go over. Um, I forgot to bring it. Probably 15 bucks up to $1,500. Right. Uh, the right tool makes the right a big difference. There's not a quality criteria on the artwork. In this class, it just needs to be your artwork. So um, I wanted to point this out. These, if you're thinking about game development and stuff, even if you're not going to focus heavily on the art side, it's probably worth your time to uh, money to buy one of a small one of these. Um, at some point, I will have them in in the lab for a class like this because, uh, but this year. Spend the equipment money on like a new VR setup. So we have VR equipment to use in the past. Because there's other ways to draw and there's not quality lift, there's not quality criteria on the art, but the art in this class does need to be your own. So if it's just um, boxes moving around the screen, draw the box. Or if all you can draw is a stick man, then draw a stick man and move it around the screen. But it is very much a skill that comes with practice, and you're going to want to start getting that practice in. So, last thing I want to try to make sure we wrap up uh, by three o'clock, and that way there's like two hours to sit there and try to extend these skills. There's three things you have to draw, but um, they're hopefully not that bad. Um, I see that message. I ask you to install two softwares. Um, are you on the live computer? Is Blender on there now? Uh, it should be installed. My Blender's on there. I don't know. Real quick, I don't see it. you had said uh, we should have got installed last week. A couple of Wednesdays, you'd be, be gone. Or uh, yeah, next Wednesday, I'll be gone. Next Wednesday. And the following Wednesday. And the following. Yeah, the next two Wednesdays. But I will have things for you all to do, such as, um, or be a good time to practice art and the skills we're going to look at today. What's that? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm going to, uh, I'll make sure you know. But you have, um, I just want to go and check it. I'll be next to you in some of the weeks in a row. It is on there. I thought they installed it on there. It's on this one. Um, You, you have Blender though, right? Yeah. Okay. So we will, there's two softwares I asked you to install. Um, Inkscape is probably not on those. So I'll just kind of go through the steps. And uh, so the first one, this is important if you're going to do 
things like video game graphics. Uh, Inkscape is the open source alternative to Illustrator. So it, it basically draws in scalable vector graphics, um, which can be very, very efficient for computers. Uh, much more efficient way and what we often want to use. We can scale them to any size, like the name implies. Uh, because instead of image data, like you would think pixel by pixel, like we would have in a bitmap uh, image, right? Each, we have a giant grid on the screen. We just define what color each pixel is. That's what how bitmaps are stored. There's no, there's very little variance on that, right? So vector graphics are stored as an equation. Uh, when we get over to 3D and look at what they look like in code, probably around 2.30 or so, uh, you can see what they are. That they look different in the text files we work with them than what they actually are. But we'll see. it's basically stored as the instructions on how to draw the image as a series of vectors. Ultimately, it ends up like connect the dots in space. We'll see it after we have an example. But Inkscape scored, stores those, and it's an equation for both 2D and 3D. SVG, well, internally to the machine, both 2D and 3D look exactly the same for the machine, what goes to the CPU or GPU. But in text files, they look very, very different. We'll look at the text file and Probably don't want to code it all up in the text file because that's a bit, that can be a bit difficult for a nice image. But the big thing we get is it will allow us to um, keep things separate. We can come back to any part of it and edit it. Just like the, we, we will be looking at an image here while we're editing it with a mouse, but Really what that's doing is writing the text file and SVG format in the background. So just like that text file, we can get back to any previous part in it and edit it. We can't do that with the, the defined, where we define pixel by pixel what the color is going to be, like a bitmap, or the more complicated storage things like things uh, or JPEGs. Those we either edit the whole thing or not at all. So it's an editing thing, really. Um, when you first start this software, it should look something like this. Uh, got our drawing surface, the tools, buttons are in different places, but hopefully everybody's seen some graphic software before, so have a sort of an idea. A lot of our properties are over here. Um, I'll open these up back up, so I'm going to close those for now. Uh, well, we have complete control over everything. First thing we want to do though, is probably adjust this because when it opens by default, it's set up where you might notice that aspect ratio looks like a page or printer sheet. Not the size we want for images. So if you go to File and Document Properties, uh, we can adjust all the properties about the document here. And um, where's my I like the mouse button. <clears throat> you see my mouse better with that? With the red dot? Yeah. They used to have a big red circle and then they took the red circle away. Or they made the red circle small for some reason. It's like the red circle is probably a lot easier to see with. Oh, no, I have to keep that open. Zoom. Uh, Changed a bunch of features in the last update. Have y'all noticed chats don't go away anymore? It started uh, two weeks ago, but the Zoom chat is now saved forever, and you have access to it all every chat you were part included in and in your account. Just in case you haven't noticed that before, um, I usually start over on this one. So the display units, which is what we will uh, probably want those to pixels because we're not printing it. Which that's the biggest difference between Inkscape and Illustrator is Inkscape does not have CMYK colors. So what we're talking about colors, uh, 
remember back in elementary school, you learned about red, yellow, and blue mixed to give any color. And we've already talked about it a couple times, like computer screens, red, green, and blue mixed to give any colors. Um, the elementary school one, the red, yellow, and blue, it's actually cyan, magenta, and yellow, but little kids might not know that at the age of learn that. And that's a reflected light. So the light comes down, reflects off some, off some surface, and some of the light is absorbed and other bits of it bounce back. And in that case, we see what is missing. We see what was absorbed and our eyes pick up what, what is missing from those wavelengths. Uh, mix cyan, magenta, and yellow together to make any color on reflected light. But if we look at source light explicitly, we want different colors of source light, uh, our eyes perceive what is actually there. So we get a, we mix different wavelengths and our eyes perceive different if it's source light or reflective light. And for source lighting, we mix red, green, and blue. So when we print things on paper, if we're tell, doing it on the computer with cyan, magenta, and yellow, it's gonna, we're gonna have a lot more control over the printing. And the K stands for either black or clear, depending on the type of printer. Some printers actually burn things on there and then we don't need black ink because we can just use the burn effect. So clear ink and other printers have black ink, but the printer handles that adjustment. Uh, so Inkscape is, it doesn't have those, so obviously we can still hit the print button, but it's a lot better for uh, screen images because everything's based off red, green, and blue colors. So, um, so first thing, probably change those to pixels since we're using a game thing, uh, both of them, the display units and the page units. And they give it some size we're using the game. I'm just going to think to 512, 512, that seems like a good starting point. And there's no thing button, so after you type that in, just uh, close this little box. And see, now we have a little square. Um, Control and scrolling the wheel zooms in and out. And again, it'll zoom in, zoom in to whatever position your mouse is at. If you click in, it'll zoom in. Yes. Scroll. Which one? Click what? Oh, it's the, if you have a mouse there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Clicking it, clicking the mouse wheel, and it, it will lead to panning. Having a real mouse can be a, uh, Very advantageous, has a lot of advantages. Though sometimes I do really like the touchpads on the laptop for drawing and graphics because X and Y never change on the one on the laptop. If you tilt your mouse just a little bit, all your angles have suddenly changed and you have to adjust while you're drawing. Um, but that doesn't happen with the touchpads, but Usually the middle wheel is used a lot for scrolling in and out. I'll probably be, I'll be doing the examples with the, the touchpad today because I've got to bring a radio house. There's a box of them in the closet, but uh, <clears throat> I guess it's uh, something that will make a better game character size, a starting point. It's not obviously, not obviously set up for printing. And if you want to, if you go to file and you can save that as a template. Um, I just need some name, but if you set as default template, that's the keyboard a little bit more than that, and click the set as default template button, then anytime you hit a new file, it'll be that size for those measurements. To avoid doing it every time. Um, oh, I have turned the highlighting off because those might be in the way unless I can. Oh, I can move them. Uh, we're just going to look at some basic stuff, right? We have rectangles and circles. We can build shapes that way. Probably not the ones we want. Not the most interesting way to do it. So, we're going down here. Uh, these three down the side here. Uh, these are more your like freeform pencils. So, so the middle one here is just a completely freeform pencil to use. Which goes great with these type of uh, 
these type of pins I pointed out a moment ago. I did turn my camera off, didn't I? Okay, yeah. Uh, but these type of pins, that pencil one works really, really well because then it's kind of like wrong on paper or with the obvious adjustments once you get used to that, those pins. Uh, then you just come in and draw so like a quick, I'll just draw a quick sketch of a character. And uh, it's that, and down at the bottom, and zoom buttons get out of my way. There we go. Um, we just pick some different colors, which we have complete control over that. If you come up to objects, once there's something there, um, fill and stroke are very useful words. That's the pattern over here. So choose fill colors, just kind of click and drag. You almost need graphic software, but really you're going to want to spend a couple hours playing around with this after the lecture component today, after the example component. Um, stroke, the X turns it off, um, do a solid one, some sort of gradient, add a outline color, the, the size of it, all of that. Pro, very big, uh, some sort of outline, and if you want those three thing, or just turn it off. Same thing on the fill color, the X turns it off, so you can have control over that, but you don't have to do super high quality images for this class, you just have to do images. But like if that was the head of a character, uh, I got that drawn, so I can come in here and maybe draw something else. So do a little neck for the character, it'll pull in and um, kind of drag the pencil around what would be a shirt. Maybe change the color up on down to the bottom, the kind of green shirt. Um, something that would be like pants or legs for the character. Make them blue. Um, yeah, I'm going to delete this one, so I'll come back and uh, I'm going to delete this one. This is just the first example. So grabbing that pencil, just dragging around and There's a starting point, right? Definitely not the best, uh, not the best character I've ever drawn. Just something really quick. And you're gonna do a lot of those. Just quick practice. Try to draw something really quick. And really, uh, what I would recommend when we're practicing today is like try to draw, do like a race, draw five characters as quick as you can, and then delete four the four that aren't the best one, and start getting practice that way. Just adding things up. Um, it does take a lot of practice. What I want to look at is when I save this. Go file, save, find a spot on the computer. I think I'm sure I'll call it drawing. That's a good name for it. Um, so SVG graphics, there's two formats for them. There is the format that goes to the CPU, which we'll look at what that, something closer to what that looks like when we're, we do 3D stuff here in a little while. Um, and then there's the format that goes in the text file. So the SVG text file looks like markup languages. Has everybody seen a markup language before? HTML, maybe? Um, uh, that was probably accentuated. Um, there's no short ones. All the tags are really, really long here. Okay, the closing tags look short. So like the HTML, they'll have really big opening tags because it just, it's a generated file. So it automatically put in all the parameters and stuff. But here's what those paths we drew look like. It's got, um, some sort of a fill style. This would be the last one drawn, obviously. So some color, a stroke to it. And then we have this. I have two numbers separated by a comma. Then we have another two numbers separated by a comma. Two more numbers separated by a comma. 
those are there's the vectors. So from the origin, zero zero will be in the top left corner. So from the origin, we have this vector that comes out to 26, 123. I'll just read the whole number part. And that becomes the starting point. And then from there, the rest of our vectors is we have this two negative six vectors. So two negative six goes up and over just a little bit to the left. Then we have four negative 12. So it goes up a little further and way over to the left. So it like got steeper and goes way over. And each one of those number pairs is a vector. And each vector starts where the last one ended. So really what we have is the instructions on how to put that image together. Not the image itself, like we would have with bitmap where it just has the pixel by pixel data. That allows us to do all sorts of things. So maybe that arms, oops, not the one we wanted. I can come up to the top here and click the arrow, the selection tool. Um, we click it. Oh, there's some trans transform data. I click and drag. There's our position, right? Location. If we click again, notice the little arrows did the spinning rounded thing, which indicates that that uh, can be used to rotate our thing. That part I put it, I was drawing this shoulder looks more like a thumb, looks more like the hand than the hand side on that. So maybe I should rotate that around and it's like a thumbs down thing. But position or location, rotation, and well, the arrows this way gives that scaling factor. So once again, it's that transform data. We will talk about that over and over and over again. Location, rotation, scale. That's the biggest thing we're working with. Um, but that's the last, the last thing done. But that's not the only one that can edit, right? I can come back to any of the earlier ones. So like the shirt and scale it a little bit taller so there's not a gap under the neck and move it around and click again to get the rotate and do all the dragging and little adjustments to get it to get a nicer draft from the first one. So the second draft isn't a start from scratch and try to make improvements. We can come in and edit this. Like the head here. Um, maybe that nose looks like a little bit of a funny shape here. This thing right below the selection tool um, has a, a box and a line and a little arrow pointing at them. If we go to this, that gives us the end of all of those vectors that make up that image. So we can go in there and start adjusting them. Like maybe that nose, <clears throat> if I click this one and drag it down, then Drag a couple of these around until it looks more like a nose shape. Oh, I don't know what was happening in there. Or I don't know what was happening there, but weird things I didn't mean for it happen there. And those can go back to the original version and make little edits until we get that final version. That's why you want to use SVG software. So if you have an Adobe license, um, Illustrator, the controls in Illustrator, this is the open source version that they were kind of looking at Illustrator when they made, so it's very, very similar. But Illustrator is expensive, and Adobe charges for colors now, too. Not all colors are included in your monthly subscription. Software as a service is not, or software as a product is not a viable business model. Adobe has a complete stranglehold on the graphics industry industry, and they can't even, Adobe can't even make it work. So if you want to come in here, uh, we'll be doing 3D from wait, six, yeah, six, seven, and eight will be in 3D. Uh, you'll be wanting to practice with 2D stuff. And this is what I mean by practice. So like very, very quickly, get, try to get the initial start of what a character model would look like together. And then Maybe draw like five, five characters really, really quick. Oh, there we go. If I move this one, it looks like he's got a big collar on his shirt. And then come in and get some practice with that those editing functions. Right, you get the first image and then 
draw a bunch really quick, choose the best one, then come back in and get scratched with the edited images. It does take a lot of practice. I've been doing this for a long time. Hopefully I'm not going to make over here making it look uh, too easy. Control Z is undo. That's pretty normal. So usually I have one hand on the mouse and the other hand on the Control Z button. Uh, and just edit and try editing those pictures. Characters can be a little complicated. You might want to start with something easier than a character. Though. I think I already said I was going to delete this, right? So. Turn them quickly. The nose tool is the only thing you have for really adjusting a thing, right? Like, I, for, for like adjusting the overall shape of something, like you can't like erase or add to it or anything like that. Oh, um, adding, you would draw another shape on top of it. Probably. Like, is that what you meant? Like, well, uh, yeah, because I, I did that for the nose. You wanted a logo on the shirt, right? Like the Superman logo. You would probably want to come through and draw another one on top of it. Oh, but drawing it now is on top of that. So if you go to object and hit lower, things are in a, a line. The first thing drawn is furthest back, and last thing drawn is in front. So we might have to move those back and forth. Is that what you meant by add, or did you mean add more notes? Uh, well, that, well, that, that that's fine with the app part, but as far as like quote unquote erasing or adjusting, like if like you know smoothing out the edges, of that you just gotta use the node tool to pull things in different directions in that, right? Or is there other ways? Um, yes. So like that, like say like right now, that little bit up there, that skin from the neck that's just sticking straight out the chest. Yes. Like that, yeah, I'm right there. there. I can do this electric. There you go. Uh, other than the no tool, is there a way to, like, like in other things, you just have a eraser tool or just, oh, and oh, no, because they're all vectors. So those nodes we're looking at are only the end of the vectors. Yeah, you, you have to use the nodes to pull everything. Right, yes. and everything. Yeah, so just the ear, kind of smooth it out, and then. You can't tell what that little line was. I wasn't going to show that, but as I moved it, and then I changed what it's doing when it passes through that vector, because it's smoothed out afterwards. Something like that. Um, you can also go in here and do this. Oh Lord! Make sure you delete a pair at a time. Three. I'll delete back this many vectors. I have no idea which one I just edited. I was expecting the arm to not be filled in. Be very, very careful editing the text file. That's like last resort, but we can go edit the text file. Maybe a better example of that would be instead of uh, doing that, I'm going to make whatever this is red. A lot of updating the Inkscape, or maybe you need to reopen it Inkscape. It should live update, so that's something on my computer. Um, don't have that. Do some sort of refresh thing of it. There probably is. I don't know where the refresh button's at. It used to live update. Maybe go to document properties and come back to it. The reject file. Uh, there we go. Control Shift X opens your editor here. So maybe I should really be doing the typing here. Oh, you can, here's um, more refined. This editor is for editing the text file. So I'm deleting the adjust buttons there, but that's that's getting a little more complicated. At least starting out, probably stick with the notes. 
But you want to practice at that. Um, maybe I do just need to close it and open a new one. I was open a new one, but it used to lifetime update. I don't know why it didn't when I changed the text file unless, I, unless I'm looking at the wrong text file. Maybe red's not a color. We put in um, B2 34 A1. Let's see if that's a different color. Okay, it used to lifetime update, and I'm not sure why it's not. It's probably something on my computer. But that was just quick examples. That's what you're going to want to do this afternoon, um, looking around. But let's uh, let's look at an actual animation. Let's apply those skills for an actual animation, a small one. You have to do a 3D animation of a tree waving in the wind. So let's do a 2D animation of a tree waving in the wind for our example here. I'm going to go back to my pencil tool. And what is that for? The animation of the tree? Uh, the sprite and sprite and model quiz, I think is what it's called. Sprite sheet and skill. skill. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and yeah, the 3D tree, like actually draw a simple tree. Like you can put a cylinder and a sphere on top of it. That'll be good. And then animate it. We'll see the 3D in a moment. But uh, when we go to use trees in our game in like two weeks or so, we will actually use the insert tree button, which is a whole lot easier. It looks a whole lot better. And it's parameterized tree, so it's really nice for programming perspective. We can reprogram the tree instead of drag our mouse around. Uh, but just a little animation here. So first thing I'm going to do is draw like a hill for a tree to sit on top of. And I went outside of those lines on purpose. Because now, um, I said that this document is 512 by 512. So I'm going to say this. Um, I'll put it in the delete folder for now. And this will be background. If I was to go open that, Notice that 512 by 512 edge. When I go bring that, the editor shows me going beyond that edge, but the uh, the file itself doesn't have that overflow. So kind of an important thing to pay attention to, but it makes it can make it a little bit quick and easy to draw, especially backgrounds. <clears throat> Same thing for a sky. Instead of a box, I'm just gonna use the pencil one and draw a big blob and make it blue for a sky color. Oh, but the sky should probably be behind the hill, right? So with the sky selected, go to object, uh, raise and lower, or the sky is going to be part of his back, so maybe lower to the bottom. Send it all the way to the bottom. Not kind of the layers and objects tab there on the right next to the hill stroke. Those arrows at the top do the same thing. Yes. Uh, I believe you can drag and drop these, can't you? Yeah. You can drag and drop, or you can just use the arrows to step from one, one up or down. Yes. The arrows are probably a lot more controlled. Something like the sky, we know that's going to be way in the back, but we won't forget to draw it until after we get all the fine details in front of it. That'll be a background. Um, that, when we load in the game engine in about seven minutes. Uh, will sit behind the actual animated tree. So now I'm going to do another file for the tree. So new uh, and here it's kind of like layer, layers, but we're going to layer it when we get to the to the game engine. This is this is what your assignment will be like. So the parts for the tree. You have a 2D sprite sheet, which um, a sprite sheet is kind of antiquated technology. At uh, one time, it was it was important because it was well, 
when we had physical spinning disc, our biggest delay was moving the reed head in order to grab a file. So in that case, it was very productive to have all of our images in one file. And then we only have to move the read head once, and then we sort the images out afterwards. It's actually the opposite on SSD drives. On SSD drives, uh, big files are problematic. Lots of small files are bad. So you can do either one for the sprite sheet. We still call it a sprite sheet, but sometimes it's one file with lots of images in it. And other times it's a folder with lots of lots of images in it. Um, servers still use spinning disk. So if your game's running on a server, having that one file, all your images copied and pasted into one great big image can be more efficient. But if it's running on a most every other computer has SSD these days. If you're running on a solid state drive, it's more efficient to have lots of lots of files with one image each we'll make both of them real quick because okay so i'm not gonna make a super fancy tree yeah just very quickly draw trunk and some branches and make sure it closes up at the end and then we click around so there's trunk and I'll just grab the pencil and um did you make a new document for this? Yes, yes. Yes. I'm gonna do this in several documents, but I'll do a quick rare little uh bunch of leads. I probably set it there and this might be a good place to right, uh evaluate things. Does it look better with the leaves behind the lens or in front of? Really color focus, it's not gonna matter here, but here. there we go. Um, I'm probably leave, leaving it behind that word. But when you're getting practice, you're going to look at things like that, see which way you think looks better. Oh. Oh, I'm just going to use the arrows. There we go. Uh, so there's the first image of a tree, and what is needed to make a tree move? That's what we need to think about with the animations. Thank you. And by the nature of this class, you don't need to worry about those super fine details in the animation. You're going to ask an art department for that, right? But you want the basic idea. You want to hit a picture's worth a thousand words, so you want to make sure the art department knows exactly what you want. So instead of an uh, animation with 300 frames and super precise detail that a team of artists spent uh, a month on, right, the Hollywood quality CGI sort of tree, just do a quick a quick sketch with five or six frames to give an artist the idea of what you want. And for starters, it, it the placeholder images don't have to be great. So that works for the first tree. So I'm going to do file and save this as uh, documents, link folder, uh, as a background, I'll call this tree zero. If you want to use pings, you can, there's an export, you can just export a ping from that, and right, the ping is not as editable, that's a finished image. Uh, Oh, we're going to do this in the right folder. Yeah. If we check file size, though, the ping is actually bigger than the the SVG. So the SVG is smaller file size, clarity on any screen because it's it's just a bunch of vectors. No matter what, it'll scale to whatever size we want it, and we never lose quality, whether up or down. So there's a lot of advantages and. In this case, it's a smaller file size. Not that's not always the case, and especially whenever you get something super detailed, you might want to check the size to see which one works better. I'm going to go with the SVGs. Any of our major, any of our game engines can handle the SV scalable vector graphics. 
Actually, game engines can usually handle the vector graphics better because they're all set up to deal to do lots of calculations very, very quickly. So when the graphics are instead of just a large data set to read in, the graphics are actually a bunch of calculations to do, the game engines usually do better with those. <laughs> Unless it's like Unity and they took forever to get in because they um they kept not being happy with the tools, so they release it in beta version and they take it out and then re-release a different one in beta version and stretch that out for like 10 years. So Unity didn't have one for a long time, but usually game engines do better with SVG. All right, there's first image. So if I'll, I'm going to save a copy of that uh, as tree one. And what happens when a wind, blow, wind comes through and hits the tree? I could probably do this playing the tape on the screen, right? Where's my uh, oh there we go. And tape and oh drawing tool. There we go. What do you want? The wind's gonna come in, something like this. Uh those are zoom lines, not uh not inkscape lines. But the wind's coming in, so that's going to ruffle the tree a little bit, right? So to animate it, um, let me clear those out of there. Really, what we need to happen is just sort of a little bit of rotation or shuffling. <clears throat> I'm going to grab the selection tool, select all of this, and then I'll let's see. Got all of them selected. Be careful when ink. Inkscape Illustrator does the same thing. If I let go of my mouse here, which one is that going to, is that going to select both of them? Looks like it's excluded. Some software, it only has to touch it. Uh, some other software, it has to fully enclose it. So in this case, to select both of them, you have to make sure it's fully enclosed, which is actually a property you can change. So go in settings and stuff, but that's getting into advanced art stuff. So, but um, there obviously like all software, there's a menu called menus called properties and settings and all of that. So like both of them and click, and that wind's just gonna make the tree rotate just a little bit, right? Take a little bit over. Are you rotating? Um, you click it once and then uh, the arrow should change. Yes. So select it and then click again and the arrows to the arrows do the rounded thing. Uh, and then click again. And then you have the rotation arrows. So I'm gonna just rotate the whole tree slightly. But the top of a tree is a lot more bends a lot more with the wind than the trunk, right? So I grab the whole thing, and that's like, I'm gonna come back into the top, and have the top of the tree shuffle just a little bit more than the, uh, than the trunk of the tree. That'll work. I'll, um, so stay three one then. I'll save as, um, we can move on to tree two. And this one takes practice. Even yeah, this this is that's the easiest thing to mess up with when you're saving multiple files for your spreadsheet or whatever, is getting them all in uh, not overwriting any of the files. So I'll do the same thing again. I'll grab the whole thing, rotate it just a little more like the wind's blowing heavily, and grab just the top of the tree and rotate a little bit more like the wind's blowing heavily. So it's back to that thinking thing, the logic. Um, right at this point in your software development career, you've got a little bit of practice with developing an algorithm. And there is, you do need to put together an algorithm for an animation. It's not random pictures, right? You want a very specific thing to happen. So take a moment and think about what needs to happen. And then it, it is very similar. It's, yeah, since this is a programming course, you're putting together an algorithm for each frame of that animation, each state the tree will be in. I'll give that a save. 
Um, now I'm going to create a new one. Those are all 512 by 512, right? So I'm going to create a new one. And this one, I'm going to adjust the, go back to those document properties. There are four trees. So 512. Three trees right now. Uh, and I do zero, oh, three trees. Um, I'll make it big enough for four still. Uh, yeah, we're short on time. 512 times 512. Oops. No, not times. 512 plus 512. So if I do 1,024 by 1,024, <clears throat> two of those next to each other and do it going down. Or I could fit four across. Four across is a lot easier to go for in a spreadsheet, but something like that. Come up with a size that you can fit all of them in nicely. 1,024. Right here, 1,024. Just close those properties when done. And now, um, and come over file and <clears throat> those images I just created. So for the single single uh, file file sheet, I'm tree zero. I'm going to include SVG image as edible objects. So yeah, probably might as well keep them added or add new SVG as page in the current file. Lots of options. I'm just going to go with that default one. Bring you, that in and yeah, then you did file what import? Yes, file import. And then choose that is the file you just made. And now notice up here at the top, there's the boxes. Right? We're programmers, we like the boxes we type in, not dragging our mouse. Let's give those the mid precise numbers. So let's set the XY position for on this one, zero, zero. Um, we're gonna Type in a height and a width as well. Now do that again. File import tree one. Let's go with the defaults. And you move it over. It I was expecting it to bring in the whole five drop by five drop image, but it was it was like, oh, I don't need that much space. So really what we want to look for here is make sure these are evenly spaced. So I'm gonna move it about where it needs to be. And use a whole number here because to pull the images from this one file, we're going to need to code the images. So 357 over, probably move that to 360. And then that gives us a nice little uh, spacing, zero. And look for those numbers that you can use in the code later when you load the images in here. Actually, all three of them will fit here, one. Uh, import. Since it didn't bring the whole image in, I guess that calculation was a little bit unnecessary. One of those other options must have got it. So I'm moving over here about where it needs to be. But really, I know exactly where it needs to be because from zero, first one started at zero, zero. Second one started at zero, 360. So this one's going to need to start at zero, seven, or seven twenty zero. If I had to guess, having it importing it as an edible object probably made it just import it as yeah, just the objects and not the whole file. Yeah, but now those three fit nicely, and when we get to code, we know it's this one starts at zero zero and is like what three hundred fifty wide. This one starts at three sixty, it's three hundred fifty wide. This one starts at seven twenty, it's three hundred fifty wide. So that's a really easy thing to do <laughs> where those images are at in this file. And then the height, we can probably adjust that. Um, uh, didn't my weight. I'll make a reference here. I'm going to delete this box, but just make it a box so I can see that, that is 200 now. So 202 pixels should be plenty enough height for this one. Okay. Properties. 202 pixels tall. Oh, well, that didn't work. And pixels. Uh, I tried 400. That was my original guess of what it was going to be. Maybe a little more. 
400 and 432. That's a good number for it. There we go. So that's what that's how we would make a spreadsheet. And you want to pay close attention to those numbers because you're going to ask for those, ask for those images in code later. Both of them are called spreadsheets. So that's tree. Right. So for that um, spreadsheet assignment, you can either turn in three separate files or make the three files and then put it in one file or just for general practice. You say it doesn't take much to copy it over to the other file. Most of the most of it goes into the thought for pre-planning how you're going to code around that file. Positioning them so that you can actually, you'll be able to access them all in the code. It doesn't make much to turn both of them in. Feel free to do both for the quiz and just put it in a zip folder and upload it. But either either format is fine. Um, ultimately, though, independent images are going to be better if your game is going to play from something with a solid state drive. And sprite sheets, the traditional sprite sheet is going to be better if your game is going to be played from a computer that has a traditional spinning disk drive. Servers still use spinning disk because they're more reliable for longer periods of time. They last longer than solid state drives. Uh, or not longer, a number of uses. Servers get a lot more hits than your own laptops. Right? Millions of people will be hit it as I'll be using the laptops to request things from the same server, especially with games. So it uh, they have more reliable parts and spinning disk are more reliable. So if you're going to a server spreadsheet, if it's running on, if they're going to download the game and run it locally, independent images. I'm about to say, because I know that some people use uh, disk drives and some people use solid state they, like for their personal computers too. Even. So, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. There's, there was anything that yeah, so sometimes we can't really adjust for it, but it, if possible, it's good. It, it helps buy us a few nanoseconds, a few milliseconds, and every time, every time we can buy a couple hundred milliseconds, those add up. So, theor depending upon the game, would it there theoretically be a detectable dip, like to the human? I, I know it would be able to the human. Would there be a theoretical point where you could detect a difference on the? A solid state versus a hard drive computer. But it depends on the graphics. So think about how good computer graphics can be. Right, photorealism are very, very, very large files. So the difference between retrieving independent files versus a, a single file spreadsheet would be even noticeable time scales again. I don't think you want to play bite size for images on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. You 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 want to you want to minimize your file size, but yeah, we can go beyond megabytes. We can have gigabytes and just a simple image, mm -hmm. uh, which you would definitely notice it. You would notice it in megabytes, but like yeah, there's just point out. Try to keep your images under megabytes if possible to avoid that. But it's hard to give an exact number because that's also different machine to machine. Which is why all all the various video games you can get have uh, specs with them. Yep, they tell you what server they're running from. You have to dig for it because usually it doesn't matter, but sometimes it does. Well, I wasn't even talking about the I wasn't talking about the server. I was talking about like when you go to get a game, they'll have system requirements. So, oh yeah. You know, what what minimum will their game will their game run on? What what is the minimum computer you need to not explode while playing this game? Yes, yes, because it seems computers have gotten big, but we. We can make bigger requests. We can still make bigger requests than they can handle. All right, let's uh, let's see how to load up with this 2D sprite. So I'm going to go over to Godot and create a new game. So um, I'll just call this like Windy Day or something. Click the Create Folder button for compatibility is good. Get version control. I don't know if we're going to have time to get into the version control thing. I'll only show you where the button is. Uh, Version control is built into all of our game engines. It's usually off by default, but uh, just like all these other buttons and controls we have on the editors, there's usually some for Git version control as well. 
Um, to do the image, I'm going to create a 2D scene. Give it some sort of name. I'll call this Windy Day. In snake case, that way it matches the way you know codes. Now, I need to load these images in. So, a couple ways to do it. Um, we could sync it with Inkscape directly. We could just tell it where Inkscape is and it could just look for any files we create with Inkscape. Um, we're going to do that with Blender. So, this time I'm going to go this way. Go over to where those files are saved and just click and drag it over. Might want to put it in a folder for our example here. I'm just going to put it all at the top level. So just click and drag it over. That's the exact same thing. I'll do, I'll grab these three tree ones and hit copy. That's exactly the same as going to where I created that file. Windy day and hitting paste here. So I just copy and paste in there and notice when I bring it over here. So this is a file explorer, so dragging and drop, dropping between it works like if you had two file explorer windows up, windows up. Or if you're on a Mac, two finder windows open. Same thing on a Linux, but um, there's a lot more options on how we look at files on a Linux. So. <coughs> Just kind of a drag and drop thing. And then we can start uh, bringing those in and doing stuff with it. I'm just going to drag it up here. And dragging that tree over automatically makes it a node of that. I can click, position it. I have to kind of hard to decide where we position it when it's here. Um, that's just going to look at the type. Oh, there it is. It has the name of it, it says type is sprite 2D. So single image. An animation involves several images. This is usually what I do. I just click and drag and then right click and change the type to what it needs to be. There's different ways to do it. Some people really like to look for the type that needs to be first and then drag, then add the images. Did you just grab the image and draw it to the day? Yeah. Let me do it. Uh, oh, you, you, either you, one would work. So like this? Yeah. Oh, you want to do it this way. Um, some things you will be able to click and drag this way, and some things you cannot. So it's best just to drag them over here. And then once they're here, we can change what parent they are. So like I could make do that in the background. And then once it's over here, then I can make the background the parent. I can switch what the parent of the background is. And oh, this is probably important, but it's about to show. Um, it goes in order. So notice if I put background above tree, then the tree shows in front of the background. Then we can just kind of stretch that out to fill our hosts, make the background fill more than we'll see. <clears throat> and drag our tree image to a good spot there. A little now. But if I hover over a tree, notice it's a Sprite 2D. And a Sprite 2D is a still image. That's fine for our background. I always just drag it and then change the type afterwards. But like I was saying, some try it both ways, see which let your own personal style develop. Makes it a lot easier when you have your own style for working with things instead of just trying to remember what somebody in a tutorial did. I mean, you check tutorials, just remember to look for that base concept and change it enough that you can confirm that you understand what they're doing. Uh, well, the easiest thing to change that to is an animated Sprite 2D hour, so that's what we want to go with. It's named nicely. We want the Sprite that's an animated Sprite. So right now, uh, our image disappeared. We got a little warning message. Um, a sprite frames resource must be created or set in the frames property for the sprite. That seems strange, but sprite frames, that makes sense with animation, right? Usually animations involve several frames. So it sounds like we need some sort of animator. We click on that and look over at the inspector panel. There's an animation here. 
Let's look at animation. Oh, there's the thing it said we had to have. So we didn't have a spray frame, so we need that. It's currently empty, so I'm going to click that and just see what we have. How did you get the like, the spray frame thing? Or what did you do? Oh, so I selected the tree, and then um, really this is what I did the first time. I was repeating that process. Looked over here before looking it up. I just looked at the panel and was like, um, well, maybe that's under animation. So I expanded that and just started looking around. Yeah, I don't have a spray. Did you change the sprite? If you right click and go to change type, did you change it to an animated sprite? I did not. I was the oh, yes. A sprite is a single image. So make sure you change the type. Or um, you might be one of the people that it just fits better in your mind to do the type first and then add the images to it. All of us think a little bit different. Make sure you understand how your how your brain works, because that'll make projects like this will come together a lot easier. Once we have that, we look over here and see Sprite Frames. That's that warning message we got. The only option we have is to create a new one. So if there's only one option, we might as well click that option. Um, all right, so the warning went away. Looking around here, this is what I did the first time. I already know what to do after this, but looking around, so I'm like, okay, I'm not really sure what I need to do. Um, what else do we have in our main editor section? Oh, down at the bottom, there's an animation tab. Maybe this would be useful for us because we're looking for an animation. This is what I did the first time I met, first time I used it up. A whole lot of that. So make sure you have time to click around on this with the whole projects together. All right? Don't just rush through it as quick as possible. Look at this stuff, even if it's not what you're needing. Because, um, well, if you're in this class, you're probably interested in making games, right? Which means you're going to make more than one email, and not need it as relative. You don't need it right now, but you might need it for a future game. So you want to pay attention to those things. All right. Um, select an animation player node to create and an edit animations. Uh, Message doesn't seem to help much. Um, I click the sprite frames. Oh, that was a big change. Did you all see what happened? So I was on the animation tab. This wasn't even here. Let me close this. I'm not sure what close button is. So I was on the animation tab. I don't see anything too helpful. It said I need to create something. So I went back and clicked on this thing that it already told me I had to create. And when it did that, a new tab showed up here at the bottom for spread frames. And then this one's all about animations. Animation frames, and oh, I have animation frames. I'm just going to start dragging those over. This is what I did the very first time. And it, um, that's what it took to do the animation. So there's the 2D animations. Perhaps not the best animation I've ever done. But like on a windy day, a tree, right? Not grading you on the quality of the animation, just the being able to make those steps. So everybody see what I did there? I see head nods in the class, everybody zoom okay. I slightly remember this stuff when we did it in the intro of the game dev. I think I did it a different way in the intro of the game dev class. There's at least five ways to do it. I, I went with this. Maybe we did. Because this is the one that you can look around and guess at. There's more. I don't remember, honestly, which what, what things we did. There's multiple ways to do it, right? We don't want to blankly memorize it because the software gets updated. It changes. Remember general processes. Come up with those looking patterns. Right, like Microsoft Word. I'll see you make it. Is anybody in here? I, I know you all have used Microsoft Word. Has anybody in here try ever tried to memorize every single button on Microsoft Word? No. We, we develop a pattern for how we look for the button we need. That's what we need to do with the game engines. And there's just way, way, way more buttons here. So that's why there's so many just clicking around beside the first two weeks. Just click around and work on that pattern to learn how to look around the game engine. I will say that you can make that look, look a bit smoother by using your same frames, making them step like backwards. 
Uh, well, no, like, if he takes oh, yeah. tree one and puts it at the end. That's what I was going to do. Oh. It kind of looks like it eases back. Yeah, I didn't plan on doing that. That's why I only did three instead of four. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, little things like that. Yeah. Algorithm, that's an algorithmic thing. That's a, that's like a logic error with programming, right? It skipped an entire step and it made the animation jump. And so uh, for programmers, animations often come together, but a lot of people don't realize at first you have to break it down algorithmically. What all needs to happen with it? You're going to want to practice with that. Uh, you have the quiz, that quiz, which should be fairly easy. Your assignment on that is a, a fireball. Think of coming out of a dragon's mouth and then going, and it hits a wall and splatters out at the end. You don't have to draw the dragon or the wall, but what is just the fireball? That's the that's your sprite sheet quiz this week. Wait, so we have to upload the fireball? Yes. So you do, you'll do a 2D animation. Of a, think about yeah, a, a fireball is at least the dragon's mouth. You do not have to draw the dragon. That's a different animation, right? That's a different game object. The fireball, it leaves the dragon's mouth. It's going to be small, small enough to fit in the dragon's mouth, but it needs to spread out and get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then when it hits the wall, like a castle wall, you don't have to draw the wall. Can we do what that? happens when it hits the wall? Yeah, it's going to split. It's going to fire. It's going to spread out and set the whole castle on fire. So you just, that's your quiz. So and then you made that. Animate a castle burning. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, you know, what we did here, this is your 3D. This is your 3D quiz, I believe, right? Right. Well, you don't even need to make it move, just grow, because the movement would be you slide. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The position's going to move. It doesn't have to move. The, the thing itself is just that fireball growing bigger and exploding. But you might want to do it animated. So, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Everybody's going to do it a little bit different, because there are different, way, there are different ways to do it. Some people might want to just make it something inside of the entire screen and make it move. It's easier to keep the size. So do what you think we do, but just think about just the fireball. And then you'll have a tree is the 3D model. That's going to be the skeletal animation, not the insert tree button for those who might move forward in like game of one and we look at it. We will use the insert tree button and the insert landscape button when we go to make the 3D world. But for this, it's going to be like this tree. Draw a cylinder with a circle on top and call it a tree. And then just give it a skeleton and make it run. But that's that's what we're going to look at after the break. Just have to break. I should save this. Save that yet. And then we can actually run it as a game, but we can preview that one we can see here. So it didn't start. Yet the uh do final play spray frames. Yeah. This one always it always strikes me as weird because um I mean to be fair, they don't know what the animation you're wanting to do is. Yeah, they don't know. The yeah. They don't know if this is you slapping it or something. Like they don't know if this is supposed to be triggered by an interaction. Uh, but the auto play um, boolean is in the animation player on the editor instead of this animation. Yeah, go to animation form. Oh, down here. Yeah, it's right next to the. Yeah. Oh. The other side. Right there. Yeah. Everybody see that? Hmm. There's a couple of places we can also make this inspector, or we can put it in a script and just say play. So tree zero. No, it's called tree zero. So if we drag that over to our script, it's gonna be dollar sign tree zero dot play. Uh, and the ready function will also work. Maybe that's what it, they assume you're gonna do it in the script automatically. But then we're gonna end up look like a preview. But Godot does not autoplay by default. That applies to everything that we would expect to autoplay by default. So keep an eye on this. Because again, to be fair, it has no idea what the heck you're doing or what that is for. So it might be very well be something that you're going to do when you're trying to play something or Yeah. So it doesn't have to be great animations like this. It doesn't have to be CGI Hollywood quality, right? Just enough that you show me, well, for the 2D one, that you um, understand the basic steps needed to put a uh, animation of a fireball together is what this is. And that one's 2D. That's the 2D one. Uh, then there's a 2D model and a 2D animation question. The 2D animation question is like a tree. So do a simple tree in Blender and make it move. We're going to look at that after a break. 3D. 3D, yes, sorry. The 3D one, the simple one in Blender. Yeah, because that's the one that we're going to look at. Yeah. 
would be a modifier. Uh, probably scalable. No, I mean, I mean like exporting it would be like. Oh, oh, blender, blender and Godot or integrate. We'll look at that after the break. So we don't even have to import Blender files. We just have to tell the you know that Blender is installed on our computer. We're gonna look at that after the break. Uh, Ten minutes sound good. Yeah. Uh, my laptop says two twenty three, so we would get back to it at two thirty three. I'll see y'all in just a moment. Yeah. Uh, need a uh, sip of coffee or something? Do I have any in my office? 